They can hear, can they hear all this chatter? Oh, there's Jordan. There's Jordan. Well, yes, Jordan. Hi there. How are you? Fantastic. You made it right on time, too. <laughs> that sped over. I'm glad we waited a little bit. I'm going to cut short my intro and, and let you talk a little bit. I've already told all the panelists. So the people that you see here are the panelists, Jordan, and then the audience is, I guess we don't, we don't see them. Okay. Great. So welcome everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, before I forget, I want to thank, of course, I want to thank all the panelists, Christine and Paul, Akeem, Florence and Nico, um, and Florence's students, Eve and Shizuo, Danielle, Gian Rui, and Manchin. Um, unfortunately, Gwenali had a death in the family, so she won't she won't make it here tonight, which is very sad. No matter how much it's expected, it's always difficult. Um, so we have our we have her in our prayers. I thought I'd just very quickly talk a little bit. Let's let's go to the first slide, or let's actually is the next slide the yeah. So I thought I'd start out by just for people who don't know, Mercedes wrote this article in 1963 with the striking headline, What's Wrong with U.S. Art Schools? And she wrote about all the things that she found at Pratt that were not condu conducive to the practice of art as she saw it. 1963 was when, right around when Rauschenberg won the Prix de Rome and Robert Scull had that famous sale of pop art at what was then called, I think, Sotheby's Park Bernay, something like that, where Rauschenberg got all angry at him because he had bought works for $50 and he was selling them for 10,000. So it was a tremendous time of change. There was also the Vietnam War. There was a lot of student unrest and it led to the students at Pratt asking her to start a school, which she did. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that this is the founding manifesto and you'll see all the founding artists who have since, be, even then they were recognized, but not to the extent they are now. They've since, it's since been clear what geniuses all of them were. They were all close friends with Mercedes um, and they all helped get the school started. So with that as a short intro, I want to just introduce Jordan Matter. We were very, very lucky that Akeem and Jordan were in touch with each other. Jordan is Mercedes' grandson. And um, I asked him on the spur of the moment if he would just join us and say a few words about, about Mercedes. And then another time we will organize a much longer Q and A. Akeem will interview Jordan, and we'll go into a little bit more detail. But Jordan, if you would just say hello and talk about your grandmother a little bit. Of course. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry I have nothing prepared. As as uh, you know, this was moments ago that we talked. Um, but Literally. what it did do, it afforded me the opportunity to just stop and, and think about Mercedes for a few minutes, which obviously when we get caught up in our daily lives, we don't do as often as we should. And uh, I just, I started realizing just now what a, what a huge impact she had on, on me personally and on my career. So I, I, I think what might be interesting for you all would be just for me to tell you a little bit about her life as I knew it, as her grandson more than as uh, co-artists. I, I became a photographer towards the end of her life and she was very encouraging. Uh, but she didn't have the opportunity to really see where I've taken it. Um, but she did help lay the building blocks for that. But um, the, the Mercedes I knew was more of my grandmother and, you know, an art world icon. And I was aware of all that. I, I, I met Sandy Calder. I see these names. I met these people. When I was a kid, I met Sandy Calder, hung out with Elaine de Kooning all the time, with Bill de Kooning. All these people were just coming in and out, art discussions all the time or over dinner. 
it, it was it was pretty incredible environments to be raised in. She had a house in East Hampton, and uh, she lived in it, and she also had her studio. But but I'm I'm sure anybody who knew her will will speak of the fact that she was uh, an exacting perfectionist, and that's that's absolutely true. There, she was a difficult teacher at times because she was so perfectionistic, um, but she was even more so with her own work. So if you if you went into her house, uh, it was often in in disarray. But her studio was meticulous. She would spend three to six months just designing her still life, and uh, she used uh, did a lot of still life with fruit, and they were plastic fruit. But she, but man, it took. She would have to live with the design for a month or two, then go back and rearrange it. Then when she started painting, she would start painting, and then she would use different colored masking tape because she didn't want to make a mistake in a way. So she would put masking tape on the on the canvas live with that for a few months, decide whether or not to have that one stroke of paint on there. Um, and what, what happened, I think to her in a way was she started to get so concerned about mistakes that she almost stopped creating her art. I remember one really interesting conversation she had with Elaine de Kooning about Bill. Bill had Alzheimer's and as he was getting uh, sicker, he was painting and then Elaine was deciding whether or not Bill was done with the painting. And Mercedes and wow. Elaine would have all of these arguments about this because Mercedes said he may be tapping, or the way she would say it was, he may be tapping into something deeper, Elaine. You just <laughs> don't understand. You don't. Right? Like that, was, that was how she talked about everything. I'll have turkey sandwich, for God's sake. <laughs> like it was, it was a lot. She was a lot. But uh, I lived with her in East Hampton. I, I loved her dearly. And, uh, and, and she often would, be, would come to tears with her frustration with what she wanted to create on the canvas versus what she was able to create. And it was a constant struggle throughout her life uh, to try and achieve perfection and never get there. Um, but the journey, I think, was, was, was something that uh, many people have celebrated, including all of you. And it's just great to see that her memory lives on and that you're still celebrating uh, her work as an artist and her, you know, the impact she made. And I know that she would be very proud to be part of this. And I, I'm sure that all the artists that are celebrated today, all you can identify with a bit of that, that, that uh, challenge as an artist uh, to always want to be better than you are allowed to be by your own uh, imperfections and still striving for better. And I think that's probably what this event celebrates. So I look forward to more in the future. I just want to, give you a little bit of taste of what Mercedes was like, but we should do a, a full interview because I have a lot of stories, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, definitely. I think I think I might be the only one. Oh, I see Don Kimes. Yeah, so me and Don might be two of the only people that knew your mom, your grandmother, but I can tell you that that's a really, really good invitation. <laughs> yeah, it was everything, everything all day. If I went to the wrong grocery store, uh, I would hear about it when I came back it, as if, I, you know, as if I had committed murder. It, everything was a hundred percent for her. Not she, nothing was unimportant. Everything was extremely important. Terrific, Jordan. We definitely look forward to having a much longer session with you. I'm so glad that, that we're in touch with you now. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be and and good luck to all the artists out there. I had a previous thing. I have to shoot something, so I have to run, but Look forward to seeing the finalists and, and meeting all of you at some point in the future. Terrific. Thanks, Jordan. All right. Take care, everyone. And I just I just saw a comment from Pam Tudor that she also knew Mercedes. So, you know, I think um, everybody who did know her will ask you to help organize. Um, and I see Ann Fiedelson knew her as well. Of course, I can't see all the people who are on. That's why I can only see the people who are chatting me and telling me that. But anyway, who did know her, we'd love it if you would be part of a group to organize um, Akeem's interview with Jordan and, and see what we want to do. Um, yeah, feel free to ask anything. I'm happy to tell you whatever I know. It's easier to answer questions than just to remember off the cuff certain things. But there was a lot. There was a lot. Fantastic. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Christine Berry, and then we'll have, I'll turn it over to Christine and she'll announce her, her choices. 
highlighting a selection, Christine Berry from Berry Campbell Gallery, highlighting a selection of post-war and contemporary artists the gallery fulfills an important gap in the art world, revealing a depth within American modernism that is just beginning to be understood, encompassing the many artists who were left behind due to race, gender, etc. Since its inception, the gallery has been especially instrumental in giving women artists long overdue consideration, such as in the 2016 traveling exhibition, Women of Abstract Expressionism. This show featured work by Pearl Fine and Ju Judith Goodwin, both represented by Barry Campbell, along with that of Helen Frankenthaler, Lee Krasner, and Joan Mitchell, all of whom, by the way, were good friends with Mercedes. The gallery also represents alumna Susan Vesey and the estate of Stephen Pace, who was close to the studio school and lectured there when I was a student and has worked closely with Karen Wilkin and the West Coast Alumni Chapter. So with that, Christine, it's all yours. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I, this is one of my favorite events. It's really an honor for me to have a chance to look at all this art, wonderful art, review it. It's, there's so much good happening at the New York Studio School then and now I love that we're talking about Mercedes Matter because there is a seriousness to what she was doing and an importantness. And I think like right now, the, the work that I, we were all looking at um, encompasses that. And it was really hard. I'm sure I'm speaking for all the jurors here. It was really hard to choose um, just five people. I saw so many things I liked. I took a long time and looked at everything. So I'm sorry there's only five today, but um, congratulations to everyone. Um, wonderful work. And, and I can see how hard everybody is working and I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So I'm ready. I'm not doing the, my five choices are not in a particular order. They're just listed alphabetically. So we'll start with the first one. Fantastic. Uh, so Amanda Church is one of my winners. Um, I know her work um, and I, it always grabs me. Her work is visually sort of stunning in this way with the bulbousness of the forms and the colors juxtaposed against the black just sort of pop out at you. And I find her work very pleasing. And I sort of read this piece as abstract, but you know, on further you know, review, I see it's called The Conversation. And then the more I look at it, I sort of wonder what that conversation is and, and um, what the dialogue's about. So I, I, I really, I really like her work. Awesome. Okay, next. Rachel Grad. Um, this was totally caught my eye. It was, um, I, the first word that came to mind was obsessiveness, which I love. <laughs> um, and just, you know, this is not easy, this sort of all over patterning and all over lines um, on this piece of paper done in a way that is um, perfectly balanced, whether just with the line and also with the color. It, it sort of reminded me of a kaleidoscope and, um, then I read her statement and I found out that she made this with toy trains um, rolling in paint watercolor over the paper. And I was floored by that. And she's, uh, the title is Motherhood in the Train. And so even more so, I just thought it was a wonderful thing without knowing that information and knowing her process of taking a toy train and running it through the watercolor um, made it more interesting. And she talks about sort of the disorder and the messiness of life, but I actually think she's found a controlled chaos here. It's really, really wonderful. Super. Next. This, this work by Mark Milroy, I just kept coming back to also. Like I liked it and then I just kept flipping back because I thought I got it. And then, um, you know, I, I started figuring out that it was some sort of family dinner. And I, I love the perspective, you know, looking at the father and the mother first and um, the cigarette and the glass of wine. And 
um, just the, the, the pasta being this sort of abstract spaghetti is abstraction on the table, the grid of the chair. But I slowly went around the table and sort of started just paying attention to each figure a little bit more. And I got the point, I realized that the, the, the kid with the cornflakes was probably the artist. And I, then I got fixated on the cornflake box and that just seemed so interesting to me. And then I realized that we're sitting in this blue outer space and realized that this is probably a memory of some sort. So I just, I think this is fantastic. This I could look at forever, really wonderful. Great. And everybody knows um, by now that I have an art crush on Edmund Craby. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? Um, I, you know, I look, I take time and I look at every single thing and take a lot of time. And I think I've jurored maybe three years now and every time I've picked Edmund Craby. And, you know, I, you know, I want to choose other things, but I also think this reminds us then when you like someone's work, you like their work. And if they keep your interest level up, even better. So last year I sort of thought, all right, I, I, I like this. It's one of my favorite pieces. I got, when I got to this painting this year, I felt like I knew his work better, yet I feel like he added. So I always loved sort of the drapery and the patterning um but and but now i feel like this he added beyond with this light and shadow and then this year the color was of such interest to me this light blue was so stunning and then as i looked around the canvas i saw all the other blues and then the little blue bird and then some cobalt blue anyway i i don't really you know, I see it's called nestling and I see the bird and I don't really know um, exactly what it's about, but I, f I just think this is a, a yet another wonderful painting. <laughs> I can't wait to see next year. <laughs> like, <clears throat> likewise. This was another, you know, it's, it's, you're, we're looking at a lot of things and we're looking at a lot of things on screen. And um, what jumps out to you always is something that is balanced just right. Cause I think that ultimately is, you know, one of the most difficult things that an artist can work out and figure out. And so this work by Sandy Walker, the, the drawing just flowed perfectly for me. So my eye went started at the right with this figure and my eye followed down this drawing and I love that the calf is just a different color than the other part of the body and that got me interested and then I easily flowed right to left um and you know I I feel like we always are you know reading left to right or what this just had the movement of this figure just had me going all the way through to whatever this window or this door is with this orange um color and i just i appreciate the the flow and then the stops and start with these sort of hash marks and and denser colors in the work um this is one of my and favorites. sandy was a student in the late 60s so he, he will know Mercedes well. I don't know if he's on, but we'll, we'll get him involved when we, when we be in Jordan. And here they are. <laughs> group. Thank you. Choices. Those are excellent choices. Thank you. It's a very high bar. Um, we're gonna continue moving along. <laughs> The next, the next juror is Akeem Duncan is a native of the Bronx. He is the founder and leader of Quiet Lunch magazine. His old gangster status at the magazine is incontrovertible. He is a dedicated promoter of the arts, expert mingler, profuse sweater and compulsive writer. As the leader of Quiet Lunch, he is responsible for the daily operations of the magazine. While his ogre-like appearance may be intimidating to unfamiliar onlookers, I can, I can testify that it's not ogre-looking at all. <laughs> Akeem is known among his friends and fellow staff for his bear-like hugs, his excessive humor, 
and his untamed passion for the work he does at Quiet Lunch. And with that, we turn it over to Akeem. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say it is a pleasure to uh, be here this evening and um, partake in this process. Also, that is a very dated bio. I do not sweat nearly as much anymore. <laughs> I've gotten my, got a, I've gotten my, <laughs> I've gotten my perspiration under control. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, so let's 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 get into this. Um, my first artist is, uh, and again, this is not by hierarchy by any means. Uh, but my first artist is uh, Susan Arena. Um, I was immediately drawn to Susan's work because it's, it's kind of a serene, kind of surrealism in a way, like a very, yeah. And there was something very straightforward, but all strikingly bizarre about it. it, was, it was, and uh, it reminds me a little bit of Alex Katz in the eyes. A little bit. I always love those kind of uh, Hanna Barbera esque kind of eyes where you don't see the whites of it, and it's it's just so calming, but yet powerful. Uh, the necker shift, the Chihuahua, those little accoutrements, those little touches right there. I absolutely love that. It, it all has a very quaint charm to it, and then also her breasts are not done in this male gaze kind of way which I purely enjoy the fact that I can, you know, that, that, that it's not just like, oh, breasts. It's just like, yeah, the breasts, they're there, like, you know? And so that was great to just avoid that male gaze in this, uh, in this, in this piece too. And um, yeah, I just, I just love it. I would personally buy it if I had the chance. Um, next one is a, uh, Elizabeth Duffy, and uh, I actually saw that um, a few people picked pick this piece, I think, but yeah, I, yeah, Nico, right? You just raised your hand? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I was like, I was like, yeah, you, you know, boo, that's what, <laughs> but yeah, so I was really hyped for this piece. I, I love uh, minimalistic color palettes, especially when they're a little dusty. Um, and where you mix that dusty with the vibrant, uh, the texture. Uh, what I love most about this piece is the fact that it's occupying two spaces at once. It's not just confined to the wall. Uh, the wall, the floor, and in each space, it seems to exist in different forms. Um, it's almost akin to the human condition or even even better yet, one's life cycle, where we're inherently the same substance, but we can exist in different forms in different spaces. So, you know, especially, I don't know if that sounds confusing, but um, especially as you age, you're still the same blood, flesh and bones that you are, but you're existing in a different form in a different space. So that's what kind of, drew me in with that and just the unraveling and the 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 this like censored and non-censored raw and artificial there's such a juxtaposition there so much contrast and yeah and I love the palette also uh I love the unraveling too I, I, yes the unraveling that, was just that so really fun. really humanizes it Exactly. Yeah, it does. And it, uh, it also shows you process, almost like, you know, the whole adage of, you know, most people don't like to see how the sausage is made or whatever. That all anecdote where you're actually seeing what this raw, the, the raw material that it kind of comes from in a way, what it takes to produce and what it takes to, you know, get there. But um, my next one is uh, Laurie Frick. Um, I'm very much a minimalist at heart. Um, you know, uh, Rothko, I, I love Rothko. Um, I'm very much minimal. Um, but with this one, I enjoyed, there was a delightful busyness to this that I enjoyed very much that held me captive. And then also it was very glitchy, but 
so earthly in texture with the wood. And um, then you also have the, the words in there where you see this, this printed kind of, where it gives it, where the glitching also, it's, also, it's almost like a marrying of the organic and the inorganic in a way. And it shows how even mirrors our society today where, or, or at least I would say any, any, um, any human, any society that's up and running where we kind of have one foot in and one foot out in some cases, unless you're a big thriving metropolis where you, you know, you no longer have bones because you just sit around all day and press buttons. But um, yeah, it seems like, it seems like you always have one foot in and one foot out in the, in the inorganic and the organic. And uh, I, and I also like the fact that she used the term personal data when referring to her medium. I thought that was very cute. Uh, and yeah, so, uh, and then here we have, uh, next we have, Terrific. uh, Amanda Guest. Um, when, when I was making my picks, I, attempt, I attempted to stay true to my taste, but I also wanted to be thoughtfully diverse and uh, photography's legitimacy as a medium has experienced its criticism. You know, it's like, oh, some people kind of say, eh, you know, it's photography, I guess, you know. But no, it, I, but I happen to feel that the act of capturing the sentiment that is there and captured by the human eye and the successful execution of that very act isn't something to scoff at. So uh, with Amanda Guest, she does this and, and more. Uh, in my opinion, with this, with uh, with this piece, with this still life piece, uh, it's it's living, breathing decay. That is that that that's what I saw here. Um, as someone who has suffered and continues to suffer from depression, this is a familiar scene. Is it it? And I think it's something that we all go through, where we allow things to pile up in life, while still operating at a certain, you know, um, it, it, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's a, it's a picture perfect portrait of the day of a day in the life of a functioning depressive. Like that's what I see when I see that. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, yeah, it was a grim charm for me that I really enjoyed. Uh, next, uh, I would think, and lastly, um, there's almost no words for this. Uh, I think Fran, Fran does a splendid job of moving and placing paint. The, the, the texture in this, the color, the composition, it, it's just, it, it's perfect. Um, I am not trying to be, I'm not trying to shovel it here. When I say that I kind of salivated when I saw this painting, <laughs> like my mouth waters and the that's something I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience. Might seem very weird, but um, yeah, for me, this painting, I feel like I feel like anytime I could look at this painting and it's like smelling salts. Like I could just like I just I just come alive when I look at this painting. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but yeah, the way they're playing with different textures in in regards to the eye, the flatness, and then the non-flatness. It's just it's just a wonderful, wonderful piece. The palette, just amazing. But yeah, those those are my picks. That's not cheesy at all. That that's what we all live for. I think that experience. Yeah. Um, terrific choices, Akeem. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our next juror is Paul Estastio. I think I have that close. <laughs> close. I forgot to check in with you. I had it right last year. Paul is from Hollis Taggart Contemporary. Hollis Taggart was founded in 1979 with a mission to present museum quality works of art and offer personalized support in all aspects of art collecting with a particular focus on the post-war era. Some of the artists most closely involved with the studio school include Alexander Calder, Nicholas Caroni, and Elaine de Kooning. 
Also, the gallery worked with Mercedes Matter to put on an exhibition of her father's work, Arthur B. Carls. Today, the gallery's program has grown to encompass contemporary practitioners as a vital component to art historical discourse and has a new space dedicated to the contemporary division, which is run by Paul. These two intersecting threads offer Hallis Taggart's audiences and clients a, dyna a dynamic and diverse set of offerings. All yours, Paul. All right, thank you. Yeah, my name is Paul Epstathiou. That's, uh, I know we should have gone through the last name. The Greek last names are very tough. Um, but yeah, I'm so, going to remember it. Yeah, I know it's tough. I mean, even my mother-in-law still can't say my last name. So it's like, <laughs> now Akeem, you're a Bronx native. I went to high school in the Bronx. So very cool. Yeah, Mount St. Michael. <laughs> anyway. My brother actually went there. My brother went there. You did? Oh. Yeah, he played cool. football. Oh. Yeah. But enough about sports, we're talking about art. <laughs> I'm the same. But uh, yeah, in a nutshell, yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank, you know, everyone that's here today. All the artists really did a fantastic job. Um, just a bit about myself. Yeah, I'm a second generation art dealer. Uh, my father had a gallery in the city in the 80s. And, and I started to curate for four or five years. Then Hollis Taggart uh, hired me to be director of contemporary about two years ago. So it's been really fun. The second location pretty much dedicated towards um, curating and, and uh, putting on contemporary exhibitions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Michael and, and everyone. Um, so yeah, so I guess let's get to our, uh, to the choices. Terrific. So yes, yeah, Stephanie Franks. Um, you know, I, I, I noticed that I also picked her last year. Uh, when I did the, but she had a pink work with different forms. So same thing like what Christine was saying, it's really nice to see as the artist progresses. I also, I remember picking Amanda Church last year and I came very close also this time. So the five was really tough just to let the artists know out there. I looked at these, the, the works multiple times, um, different moods, different days. Uh, but I really love this work. I think it's just a really solid abstract work. I really love that bottom line that you see that kind of like grabbed me and that probably was the, the pull for that decision for Stephanie's work. Um, I really wish I could have seen all of these actually in person because I know each work really has its own energy and feel to them and scale. But um, yeah, I just really love the brush strokes here. It's very meditative. Um, I was in Greece at the time on vacation when when I was looking at all the work, so kind of thinking of the Aegean Sea might have affected me too, but it's just a really beautiful, beautiful work. And I love the color combination, but I really love that bottom part, that line kind of uh, grabbed me towards that work. So next. It is beautiful. Yeah, Bailey, uh, this work, I, I, I really, really liked for, multiple reasons. Sometimes it's hard for me to articulate. I just had a gravitation towards it. I really loved all the body parts and the, just the flow and, and um, the flow and the forms of this painting I really liked. And then I really was intrigued by the title of the work, uh, The Raft of Medusa. I actually wanted to talk to the artist and I wanted to find out why um, she titled it, but yeah, uh, there's a lot of mixed emotions. You know, you have the, the person to the left with the head down. I'm not really sure what's going on in the middle, what body part or what's, what's going on here. But I really love that, that fade to it, you know, that kind of fades out. But yeah, this blue kind of, yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a really striking striking piece to me. And look, even in the middle, like are those eyes they're looking up? I just wasn't sure. And I think the fact that it had me questioning so much, I think that's what I really liked about it because I wanted to know a bit more. So congratulations, Bailey. Uh, Harris's work, I just thought this was really fun. Um, I enjoyed the work. I really liked the very much, um, 
drawn to artists that, that are very experimental and use all different processes, even like the artists that I, you know, represent for the gallery as well, you know, from using fly regurgitation to, you know, encaustic to, you know, all, all different types of mediums. But I just love this was on a boogie board. I thought it was really cool. It was jazzy. It had, um, you know, I love the, the forms to it. And yeah, just a really great piece. It stood out for sure as I was looking through all the, all the pieces. Uh, Julius, um, this work, it's really intense, actually, um, very raw. I felt a lot going on here, really uh, expressive, but you know, a lot of things going on that I wanted to know in the artist's head or at the, at the time of making that painting, I think drew me to it. I really love the negative, unprimed like canvas areas that are a bit rough, but yeah, just the swirls and the, it, you know, is that a, possibly a snake coming up in that black, you know, pigment area or looks like charcoal um, or the oil that she used. Yeah, it was, it was a really, uh, really intense work, but I like intense. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think a lot of us do in the, in the art world. Uh, yeah, it was, it was philosophical, really beautiful though. Beautiful, but really uh, powerful, powerful work. And it's 72 by 68. So to see that in person is um, be really cool. So I hopefully I get the chance to see all the works in person. We are going to have a show at the JVP galleries at 122 grand. Oh, okay. All right, great. So yeah, you, you, you probably will have a chance to see it in person. All right. Uh, Jessica, I really love this work. Um, it put me in a good mood. There are a lot of really good vibes in this work. For some reason, I thought of my nine-year-old daughter with this work. So that's an A++ because she's my world. Um, and yeah, it's just, just this work had the collage aspect. And another piece, like I could just tell I really want to see in person. You know, I love that there's horses riding in her face and look at her hair and all that like scribbles and galaxy or or it was just very meditative, um, really good energy. I felt to it, hopeful, sweet, um, picking the flowers. Yeah, I love her outfit. Um, yeah, just then and the title of it called Offering. And yeah, I was just really drawn, drawn to this piece. Um, in many ways, but really, really beautiful. Fantastic. All right, and that's that's the selection. So congratulations to all the artists. It was definitely tough, um, but yeah, very happy with the selection. Congrats to everyone. Great, great choices by everyone so far. Really, really interesting. I mean, I'm always, I'm always amazed at how good the work of Studio School alumni is and how there's no one style. Everybody is, is interested in different themes and different challenges. I think it's, it's a real testament to the pedagogy of the school and Graham's work, especially given the way, given the, way the art world has changed over the years. Um, He's really done a hell of a job. Yeah. Next, we have Nico Whedon. We're gonna we're gonna leave Florence and her and the students for last. Nico Whedon is an independent art advisor, curator, educator, and writer. Through her consultancy, Nico Whedon Projects, she delivers cultural strategy and curatorial guidance to artists, cultural institutions, foundations and government agencies. Nico is also co-founder and principal of Building Fund LLC, a New Haven-based innovation platform of by POC artists, entrepreneurs, and neighbors. As an arts writer, Nico has contributed to Artnet News, The Brooklyn Rail, and Dossier, among others. Nico is also an adjunct professor at Barnard College, Brown University, and Hartford Art School, teaching at the intersections of art history, 
creative and cultural entrepreneurship and museum studies. Finally, Nico serves as a board governor at the National Academy of Design and the Arts Council of Greater New Haven. Previously, Nico served in senior positions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Rush Arts Gallery, and Next Haven. I should also mention Nico has a book that just came out, um, Undoing the Museum, Tools to Decenter Institutional Authority and Mobilize Cultural Citizenship. So with that, Nico, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Rachel, too, for inviting me to be here today. Um, this is fun. Thank you also just for the opportunity to like sit and enjoy and look at art. Sometimes I forget to do that as much time as I spend on a screen. Um, yeah, really having the opportunity to like take a beat and sit with work and to imagine artists in their studios is a gift. So thank you for that. And thank you for all the artists that make the work. Um, yeah, like Michael said, you know, I've kind of built a career working in artist founded spaces um, and spaces that serve artists in really deep ways. And so I see a natural union with the studio school. So thank you again for having me. Um, I have some notes here because I've been awake for like two days. So please just bear with me. <laughs> um, the first Absolutely. Part, no worries. Thank you. So yeah, I feel you, Christine. I like uh, the conversation as well. This is the very first piece that I chose. So there is maybe a hierarchy here in terms of just what jumped out to me very instinctually after going through all of the work. Um, yeah, and I love that it's titled A Conversation. You know, I really do get the sense that there is a dialogue happening here and that it's between multiple subjects. I don't know what kind of subjects, but I don't really feel a need to know. <laughs> um, and because it kind of toggles back and forth between figurative and abstract, you know, it, it, I just find myself coming back to it multiple times and seeing new narratives and imagining new conversations. Um, I'm also a child of the 80s, so the color palette like it was really speaking to me, maybe, that, <laughs> maybe that's where that came from. Um, yeah, and I just think it really encourages you to see something new every time that you look at it. And so um, I'm you know, just curious to see more work by Amanda in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, Akeem, love this work too. Um, yeah, I just like that it refuses like a singular kind of objecthood. You know, it's like, I, I know I'm looking at one uh, I don't know what the word is. I know I'm looking at something that used to be <laughs> one piece, um, but I don't, you know, feel anything about the fact that I kind of am reading it as two distinct separate pieces kind of combined by this thread. Um, and I like what the artist talks about in terms of, you know, the stains and how those kind of unravel and then show up in different ways in the work and what that means in terms of an object's ability to kind of carry traces of human activity and human behavior. Um, but really I look at this and I see a time capsule, which is like strange. <laughs> um, I also like that the piece that feels most kind of tidy or that the piece with, you know, the cleanest edges is on the floor and the piece that looks a little bit more disheveled um, with the frayed edges is on the wall that feels like, you know, kind of upset of what you might expect to see in a traditional kind of gallery space. Um, and I just love it. I love the colors. I love everything about it. Um, I would love to see it in real space, um, but even through the screen, I'm able to kind of imagine what it might feel like. Um, yeah, and I think the other, sorry, just one more thing. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, similar to you, Akeem, I tried to look at the exhibition as a whole and, you know, pick different mediums. And for me, there was just nothing like this work in the exhibition. It was really a singular um, kind of vision. And I just, again, I'm really excited to see what this artist gets up to again. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this had me like deep in my feelings. Um, I love this work a lot. It reminds me of living in London. I lived there for five years during um, my master's program. I was a goldsmith. So PIMS was like, you know, on the, <laughs> on the menu for any summer celebration. Um, and so in reading, you know, the kind of artists thoughts behind this work, you know, the ways in which the still life really speaks to some of the angst um, of the pandemic, you know, I think that there is something really palpable about that here. You get the sense of celebration, but that also it's like a celebration cut short or something, you know, like, and I think I get that from the fact that 
these are stacked up and they're waiting for someone to do something with them. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it reminds me of the roller coaster of different emotions that, you know, I think we've all kind of felt over these past couple of years and it does it like in a formally brilliant way that isn't, you know, sometimes I look at still lives and I'm like, that looks staged, <laughs> but this is like, no, that's probably how your kitchen looked after your party. Um, <laughs> and so there's something really authentic about, about this that I just love. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So like, I don't, I can't even tell you what I like about this work, but part of it is that, you know, so we're looking at all these works on a screen, as someone said, and I think this just jumped out to me. Like I was able to see the layers and the texture in a way that I wasn't in other works. And it's not, you know, I don't say that to like compare in a negative way. I just think that there's something so like three-dimensional and vibrant about this work that I don't even need to see it in person to feel the kind of aura and the energy that's emanating off of it. Um, and so the more I kind of read about it, you know, I understood the process and that lace was really part of kind of creating these material layers um, but also these like conceptual layers and layers of, you know, referencing different kind of histories, um, you know, of textiles. Um, and so I just, I find it beautiful. And I, it's another one that I really want to see in person. Um, and somehow I was super shocked that it's basically like the size of a piece of paper. <laughs> okay. Like I thought that it was going to be as big as a canvas, um, but I was wrong. Um, yeah. And so I just, I, there's something really simple about this work that it is just the energy in it that is really appealing to me. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I like, I went back and forth on this one and I think what ultimately landed it in my top five was that, you know, so the shadow and light and all of that kind of, you know, formal play on the canvas is really brilliant. And the softness of, you know, the colors and the choices and the contrast of the colors really kind of evokes this sense of like heat um, in the summertime. And I just really, I liked the moment that was captured, but I think the thing that drew me in most was that I didn't get like a creepy voyeur sense <laughs> from this. Like I felt like the artist was in the moment with the sitter, um, which I think is really hard to achieve. Um, I think honestly, it's like part of why I struggle with painting in general. Um, but this, there felt like there was some, you know, divide between subject and, and the painter that was just completely, you know, blurred or abstracted in a way that felt, um, yeah, just like really potent. And so it's a place that I want to go. It's also like a mood that I'm like, yeah, let me sit outside under a tree in a garden and read. Um, that would be <laughs> an ideal way to, to do things. So I think that that's the last, yeah. And that's the group. Congratulations. It's interesting to hear you say that that you go back and forth on some of these uh, and that you're conscious of that. What how do you how do you finally decide on something, yay or nay, in the end? Is it just in the end, is it just gut reaction? Yeah, I'm learning to trust my instincts more. So I think it is, it's like an instinctual response. Um, but then I also like I pull out and I imagine the panel and the choices that we might make as a group. And there are certain works that I have faith will be in there, regardless of if I pick them or not. <laughs> um, and then there's other works that feel really personal and that, you know, I don't know that someone else would feel that same connection to that work. And so that's how I kind of, you know, made those choices. Awesome. Wonderful choices. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Gwenelie Zercher can't be here tonight. She had a death in the family. I will just quickly go through her choices. Uh, I won't talk about them. I think that's, that's more for her to do. But on her gallery, Zercher Gallery represents Kylie Staver, Lynn Umloff, and June Leaf, among many others. Zercher Gallery New York was founded by Gwenelie and Bernard Zercher in 2009 as the New York branch of their Paris-based gallery Zercher. Both founders have had several significant art monographs published by Rizzoli. Bernard and Gwenoly opened their gallery in Paris in 1992 and were encouraged to show painters and US artists by their friend, Joan Mitchell. Since Bernard's passing in early 2017, Gwenoly continues in New York and now partners with different galleries in Europe. So can we have the first choice? 
Rose Appel, by the way, she's also a student who would know Mercedes, who was there in the early days. Carol Diamond. I don't know if any of the panelists want to jump in and just um, give a comment or, or something on, a, on any of these works while Gwenaly's not here. Paul, maybe uh, I'm going to call on I'm going to call on each of you. Paul, would you would you what's your response to Kylie's? You're putting me on the spot here. I'm going to, but, but I'm equal opportunity. Everyone, everyone will be put on the spot. What do I like? Uh, I love I love the lavender. I love the purple. Um, I do like the grid effect to it, and then you have these lines coming down. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really really nice work. It's coral. It's called portals. So that's really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a really great work. I like it. It's got the some wash effects to it, and it's all oil on canvas too. Yeah, fantastic. Put me on the spot, Michael. So that's you know <laughs> best I'm gonna do. You you pass with flying colors. Yeah. All you right. Set a high bar. Now, now the others have no choice. I, I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> so let's see the next one. So if you want to volunteer, then I won't. I won't call on anybody. But if no one volunteers, then I will go with Nico next. Can I do the sculpture that you passed, the object on the floor? Yeah, I love it. I love it if you volunteer. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, not that I didn't like that other one, whoever painted that, that's nice. Um, yeah, I, so this is cool. It reminds me of looking in outer space or something. It reminds me of like a Betty Saar work as well. Um, and just thinking about, yeah, like how these different objects, which seem like, fa yeah, found metals um, are kind of brought together in what looks almost like a, a constellation. Um, at least that's what I saw when you scrolled through it the first time. But now that I look at it, at more, you know, there does seem to be a real kind of, I don't know, like a reference of a, a star almost. Um, yeah, I just like it. I like the texture. I like the kind of assemblage, you know, effect. And yeah, I just, I like that it, it's on the floor, even though it feels like something that should be in the sky. Um, yeah. Fantastic. No, it's great to hear, and I, I really applaud all of you. It's great to hear off-the-cuff reactions to something you're seeing for the first time. Florence, do you want to, we haven't heard from you yet. Do you want to take the next one? Well, quite honestly, oh. I think as I look at Gwynnelly's selection, I just really see her aesthetic, and, uh, and that's what I like the most about what she selected. I really see uh, what she shows in the gallery. You showed one of a work that kind of speaks a little bit to Lim Love's work. Um, so I just feel like I really see her in her selection and she really made a really good um, selection. And I have to admit that I actually did consider that work as well when I looked at the exhibition. I love that piece. I did too. I, this one I almost chose. It is very musical to me and that rhythmic pattern we probably all see and it almost looks like music, you know, notes. Um, obviously I'm not a musician, um, but I do. I like that this pattern it almost like represents something or symbolic of something and it's July 4th reverb. So anyway, this definitely relates to music and it has a dance to it. So it's, this is a great and I love the black and white, and I'm sure the mylar in person, there's probably a transparency or translucency that happens in person as well. Yeah. It actually it actually looks like the coil from one of those uh, self-playing pianos. From oh, like, uh, yeah, it looks like <laughs> where, where, you know, and the metal kind of like catches on each nick. Yes. And yeah, it has also a very kind of Morse code kind of feel to it. Uh, yes. dots and dashes um yeah definitely some kind of it's like a just, uh, almost abstract binary code yes. of uh shapes which yes. is uh pretty interesting too awesome is there is there one more i forget okay jill lear um 
Akeem, do you want to take this one? <laughs> um, I actually do not like this piece. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to say that. I mean, you know, art is not just about saying nice things. But um, I do like a certain component. I, I really, I, I think that's a, that's a very good point to make. And it doesn't mean that it's not good art, but I'd love to exactly. hear talk to us about exactly. it. Exactly. Um, I very much like the scatteredness of this. It has like a very abstract root kind of feel to it. Uh, it looks like a tree, that's, uh, but uh, trees on top of trees, on top of branches. I love the different patterns. Um, again, uh, the fact that it is, it looks like a collage or because it's a uh, Japanese paper or a wooden panel. Yeah, I, I I love I love all of the noise that's going on in here. Um, I like uh, even when it comes across towards the middle, you could almost see it almost gives it almost makes the tree take root. Like you can you can see that there's ground that is that it's uh that it's enrooted, and yeah, it's a very it's a nice casually busy piece. I I I, I enjoy it. Not and really I, my cup of tea. Right? I see like a, a, I keep seeing more of the negative space in there. Like it's beautiful, the sort of branches or whatever, but it's, yeah. it's, a, it's interesting the open space that is left, which is making us look at all the really sort of formulate the tree. So I think that's, it's, it's. It almost has a uh, Rorschach kind of effect. If you say that, since we're kind of looking yeah. at it, it has like a Rorschach kind of effect to it. Yeah. I think you could, I think, Michael, you could probably tap any one of us on the shoulder and play a fun game of who sees what in this piece, actually. Yeah. That's true. That's a good yeah. idea. Because I'm, really I'm, seeing, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a tree. Christine, what are you, what are you seeing exactly again? I don't know. <laughs> I'm seeing a tree. I, you know, what's, what's, I see the tree, but I, for me, the negative space stands out more. So I don't, okay. I maybe, and this is my perspective, I look at it more as abstraction, I guess, then I'm not focused yeah. on the tree. I'm seeing more of the patterning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. Oh um, my God. Yes. French shalom. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, we heard we heard from who who Akeem and Nico have chosen chose Fran, right? Or no? Who, uh, no, Nico did not choose. Yeah, I chose Fran. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. And then I think maybe I'm I, I could have swore someone else chose Fran. I couldn't have been the only one. Well, I think Gwenaly. It's Gwenaly. Well, so. Oh, oh yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh my God. I'm, see, I was so <laughs> enraptured with the <laughs> mind, mind, mind. But yeah. that was great. Thank you. Thank you for all of you for letting me put you on the spot like that. Now I'm very happy to get to my good friend Florence Lynch and her students. As I said at the beginning, uh, we're really interested to see what young people respond to, and um, especially people who have gone through such a great uh, educational courses with Florence. Florence is a New York-based art dealer and former director at Elizabeth D. Gallery. She co-owned Lynch Sam and founded Florence Lynch Gallery, a contemporary art gallery previously located in New York's Chelsea Gallery District. Florence has over 20 years of art world experience and has worked as an independent curator, critic, and lecturer. Florence has had reviews in the New York Times, Art in America, Vogue, New York Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Flash Art International, and many others. Florence has also interviewed or written on the works of Jenny Holzer, David Hammonds, Nan Golden, Quentin Tarantino, and David Lynch, among others. In addition to teaching in the art marketing department at Fashion Institute of Technology, where all of these students are from, Florence is also adjunct faculty at Columbia University. And what we did with Florence and her students, each, each person will have one choice. And so we'll start with Florence and then we'll go through the rest of the students in alphabetical order. 
Okay, Michael and Rachel, uh, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I thought it was just really amazing, the idea of doing this with the students. Uh, it opened up a whole different way of looking at this, of making the selection. And I think I'm certainly looking forward to hearing the voices of the students. So it's a really great thing to kind of look at now and then look at the look at the works with the uh, these young up and coming individuals who will be in the art world, who will be making um, their mark in the art world. So again, it's wonderful to be here and it's really great to have heard what the other um, committee members said. It, it was really nice to look at this in the context of an exhibition and seeing everybody's choice and kind of revisiting the entire selection process. So with that said, I'm gonna have, uh, if we could bring up my selection. Um, it was obviously very hard because the choice was to select one work. Um, and I didn't of course select one work. I uh, made a pretty vast selection which I didn't narrow down to five works. And then from there I picked the one. Um, and wow. the one picked, what's that? And I picked uh, this piece here by Benji Barnard because um, as I looked at it, the first thing that I actually did is I kind of um, took it apart. I de-layered it. I saw that it immediately has, it has an abstract factor. It has the figuration. Uh, when you look at the title, certainly um, game time, that kind of played also in how I looked at this work. So we talked earlier about Mark Rothko. When I looked at it, when you pull everything apart, there's a Rothko in there somewhere, right? Um, I like the loneliness of the piece. I like the reverence that I got as I looked at it. And again, going back on the title and sort of just playing with the game time idea this figure is, um, it was really hard to tell whether it's in a playground or where exactly, but there's clearly a basketball um, uh, net waiting for somebody to play a game. But at the same time, he's on his device. So again, I kept asking myself, what's the game time here? Is he already playing? Is that what the game time is? Is he playing a game on his device? or is he waiting for someone to come to play with him? So here again, I felt the, the idea of um, loneliness, of COVID, what would have happened? Um, Cause this piece is a 2021 piece. So I feel that perhaps that informed a little bit how he, um, the thought process in creating that work. I could be wrong of course, but again, it's how I looked at it and what I came away with. So I loved it. Uh, I like the autumn look, uh, the color composition, um, the house in the background, just about everything. So it was just for me, it was the perfect singular choice um, because it just really spoke with me. And I wanted to make a selection of a work that I could continually look at. And that's always how I select work. It has to be something that I can look at and Fantastic. We're just, you're just starting to break, your connection's just starting to break up a little bit, at least on my end. So, yeah. We'll go to the next juror, Eve. And, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, finish. Okay, we'll go to Eve Adsets. Eve is originally from New York and attended the University of Miami before working in museums like, and the initials are P-A-M-M. -M. I'm sorry, not sure who, what that is. Probably Pennsylvania Arts Museum, something. The Perez Art Museum, Miami. Which one, which one, Eve? The Perez Art Museum in Miami. Oh, the Perez, wow, that's great. That's getting tremendous press, actually. Um, and the Sugar Hill Children's Museum. Eve is writing her master's thesis on the work of Eva Hesse, Hesse 
as it relates to trauma and humor and is looking forward to a career in art logistics and exhibition planning. It's all yours, Eve. Thank you. And thank you for including our class on this panel. Um, it's an honor to be among this amazing group. Um, next slide. Thank you. So I also had trouble selecting one work like everyone else, but it was nice to see that um, some of the other works that stood out to me were selected by other people. So I selected this work by Lucy Lamphere entitled Barn One. I was immediately drawn to the colors and the shapes in this composition and the intense vibration between the roof uh, of the barn against the rich blue sky. I felt that this work embodied a, like a bizarre, uncomfortable or solitude experienced by many um, during quarantine. And so um, it really caught my attention and spoke to me. So I just wanted to highlight this work tonight. Thank you. Fantastic, Eve. Great job. Our next juror is Kat Kiernan. Kat is an artist and writer based in Brooklyn, New York, where she serves as editor-in-chief of Don't Take Pictures magazine, a magazine which focuses on contemporary photography. Kat, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, could I have the slide, please? Thank you. I was delighted to select Susanna Schlem's piece, Veil. Um, for me, this is a work that moves far beyond technical proficiency to evoke myriad stories in its strange imagined scene. On its surface, the scene in this painting, it appears beautiful and serene. The soft light illuminates a quiet, domestic, possibly country moment, but it's also tinged with melancholy. The crow passing in front of the shadow silhouette it has an almost mythological quality, an omen that brings us something of a message. I thought this was really beautiful, layered complexity. Um, I'm interested in works that are not necessarily of something, but that are about something. And for me, this piece is very much about something and what that something is, of course, is open to interpretation, but because the painting is grounded in realism style, um, that interpretation is more narrative than, than others. But congratulations, Susanna, on this piece. I think it's wonderful. Terrific, great job. Our next juror is Jian Ru Li. Jian Ru is from China. He has come to the USA since high school. And he says, art always provides me comfort and wonder it bridges the gap between language and unspeakable boundaries. I would like to become an artist again in the future. Jian Ru, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Everybody was talking about um, you had to choose five of our, your favorite, mm -hmm. but now like we had to try choose one of our favorite. It's a really hard decision. It's much harder. Yes, we should have got extra credit for that. <laughs> You'll have to talk to Florence about extra credit. Yes, Professor Lynch. Um, I, so my standard was, uh, Nico was actually earlier talk about the uh, say exhibition as a whole. And uh, the reason I choose this, the painting is, is that uh, the work provided me uh, something novelty, something new, not like typically traditional, uh, how should I say the Western art history, you know, Picasso, uh, experimentalism, other, other, form of art, but uh, from my understanding, I feel the artists provide a new perspective of abstracting painting for me, abstract painting. The arts, the artist experiments with a long harassing, uh, typically of a Chinese landscape, which gave us an element of uh, uh, delicism de through the, the movement of the fire or the, the image. And each painting element has a great dialogue with each other, uh, which that's the fantastic things about abstraction art. Abstract art on the top, you can say there's a blue and on the bottom, they, you can see the blue. It gave me a sense of a uh, landscape. And on the top in the blue, there's a, a, a small dots. If you small dots look like moon for me, which also I'm not trying to say that this is definitely Chinese artist, Asian artist failing, but I think it's a subconsciousness. There's uh, something going on which 
artist bring the some dreamy and uh, unconscious of a culture outside the a reality of to to our re reality world. So I really like the 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 top blue. It's kind of like a blue sky with the moon, which is a really important culture perspective in China as a moon, um, in the Asian culture, and also. This one really interesting thing about her work is that she, on the description of the work, she get, provide a po poetry inside of description of the work, which is also really typical of Asian art. You put something on the painting, a poetry, to ex ex to ex um, to make make people understand the work more. Uh, however, the way she uses abstract painting, the, the, the uh, the, the the form and the, the technique is totally different and totally new, separate with Chinese or Asian landscape art, which I think is a kind of um, I really like. I really liked her the way she doing that, and also uh, I feel like she used uh, she, uh, the, the the line the line that she used there is kind of look like a DNA, you know, the DNA line, and also look like Chinese character. The line that you you really um, struck the, the ink ink painting. So uh, you know the DNA sometimes is carry people memory the, the the human biological memory and passed down. But also also the character and the line which the made from words can carry a lot of information as well. So uh, I think she's doing really good job on this painting, and it's really struck me especially for the um the the poetry the material and the, the size of the painting so basically that's all thank you terrific great job next is danielle reichman danielle reichman is from long island new york she graduated with a ba in studio art from saint joseph's college where she was the assistant to the gallery curator which influenced her to obtain her master's degree to learn more about those practices and expand my knowledge of the art world. My goal after graduation is to work in a museum or gallery doing curatorial work and continue my practices as a painter. Danielle. Hi, I um, just wanna say congratulations to all the artists and thank you for having us. So I chose Infected Room number five by Matthias Duell because I felt that this work spoke in direct translation of the year or so we had with the pandemic. Visually, I was immediately drawn to the work because of the formal qualities. Um, there's so much to uncover in that there's no dull area, whether it's with the vibrant use of oranges in contrast to the blues, strong use of uh, shape or the directional pull around the painting. I also felt that this defined my own personal experiences with the pandemic um, and how I felt because there was so much going on, but I felt confined to a single space. Um, al although the theme of isolation is present, this painting reassured similar feelings we all must have had with the pandemic. And just overall, the painting was just visually appealing. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just rushing a tiny bit because we're running right up against our deadline. Uh, our next juror is Man Chen Wang, who is from China. He got to the Fashion Institute of Technology after completing art history at BA from New York University. Now he aspires to become a fashion designer. Man Chen has also thought about running an online gallery featuring fashion photography. Man Chen, it's all yours. Um. Okay, so this is my choice. It's Chera Chera na Vota. Um, uh, I think it's, it's I googled the uh, translation is Once Upon a Time, which is very poetic and beautiful. And the shape of this one reminds me of a mirror. It's like you look inside a reflection of yourself. It also refers to the imaginative realm. The way I see art is kind of like when you are attracted to a certain work of art, you see part of yourself in it. So this work is very interesting. And the collage technique um, uh, reminds me, uh, if you can see the texture on the surface, it looks like cracks 
on rocks and caves. And uh, this makes the painting look quite mysterious. It reminds me of the quality of traditional ink paintings in East Asia. So the piece is like a combination of the West and the East. The figure at the back, which is kind of vague, looks like he's staring back to the viewer. So it's almost like the, the work, the artwork itself is a surface that separates the imaginative world from the reality. So I just think this word is, this work is really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Manchin. Great. And our last speaker is Shizuo, who also comes from mainland China and likes to visit museums and galleries in, in their free time and plans to enter the gallery world after graduation. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to view a series of interesting works through this alumni exhibition, from still life to portraits to landscapes, as well as many great abstract paintings. And to be honest, it is also hard for me to choose just one as my favorite. Yeah, and so my choice is as in gear by artist Shusu Pianchu Patana. Yeah, and this is uh, art click on canvas. And this painting left a deep impression on me because it gives me endless imagination. So this painting depicts a man's embrace of a messy and fuzzy background. And uh, I think Susu applies a combination of abstract and uh, figurative depiction to show us a centered degree of mystery and imagination towards the background. And I also think the highlight of this painting is the richness of the colors and the multi-level of color and forms. And so the mixture of orange, yellow, and green just reminds me of a painting by William de Kooning called Two Figures in a Landscape. So even though the material yeah. of two paintings are completely different, but the, the use of mixing of colors made me con unconsciously connect these two paintings together. And also from the painting, it's, it's not difficult to find the main body color is orange, yellow, green, but also mixed with dark colors such as black and blue. So the mixture of uh, virus colors seem to symbolize the emotion of his life, happiness and sadness. So Susu's depiction of the uh, transparency of the subject and seems to express her state of integrating into life. And also um, Susu's brush strokes also shows kind of diversity. So the detailed brush strokes and the accumulation of large areas of color uh, intertwined together also reflect the chaos of life. So the transparency of the all of the color also transform this flat composition into a three dimension. Yeah, so I think her, uh, his paintings through the richness and the multi-layer of colors. So this is simple and the uh, clear interpretation of her feelings about life. So full of uh, hope and joy, but also full of tension and uh, fear. Yeah, that's all my thought on this painting. Thank you. Excellent. That, that's a very astute comment about, it, it does share a lot with de Kooning's light. Um, that's, that's our final speaker. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we're just, we are actually are just slightly past our, our ending time. I think on the next slide, I believe we have a thank you. Yes, of course. But yeah, I wanted to point out that the catalog is available at a special discounted price of $30 for the next week or so. Um, there's the address if anyone wants to order it and have a hard copy of our catalog. It does feature some of the historical documents that I showed at the beginning and some great pictures. But I'd just like to end by 
really thanking everybody. Um, Florence, I got to say, you're either a terrific teacher or you've got super talented students, but it was very impressive um, as far as the gallerists and the professional writers and critics. Really, you, you really had some very interesting comments to say. I appreciate, we all appreciate, Rachel, myself, Graham in particular. Graham is teaching a marathon tonight. He, he couldn't be here, unfortunately. But we're all very grateful to you and look forward to continuing the conversations going forward. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.